Our scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. We are looking in the 15th chapter, verses 12 to 15. I will be sharing with you from the New Revised Standard Version. If you have a Bible, I always encourage you to follow along in your own text or on the screens which are provided for you. Open your hearts to the reading of God's holy word. If a member of your community, whether a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and works for six years, in the seventh year you shall set that person free. And when you send a male slave out from you, a free person, <coughs> excuse me, you shall not send him out empty-handed. Provide liberally out of your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. <coughs> Thus giving to him some of the bounty which the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you for this purpose, this reason I lay this command upon you today, because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? <coughs> Almighty God, we give you thanks for new beginnings, new opportunities, for transformations of our very lives. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, our resurrection, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Many of you know that the month of January is named for the Roman goddess Janus. She is the only god in their makeup that has no Greek equivalent. Janus was depicted as having a double face. One face looked to the past for wisdom, and the other face looked toward the future and a bright beginnings. Janus was thought to influence beginnings and endings, and that is why in many homes and doorways you would find a replica of Janus. And January is that time of year. Janus, January, you getting it? Where many of us take inventory of our past and make corrective resolutions for the future. But in times of change, of grief, and of loss, we may need to look back then and to remember. We may need to embrace the pain, celebrate the joy, and find a new way forward. Ministry Matters, a preaching resource that I use regularly, puts it this way. We bless the best and make these corrective measures to go forward in faith. Since an honest, in-depth inventory of the past is sometimes painful, we tend to skip over the painful, embarrassing places that undermine our favorable self-image and to dwell on the times and the places that make us look pretty good. Oh, we will root around in the events of the past year and find a few not-so-bad things we thought we said or did and exercise enough superficial honesty about socially acceptable foibles to fool any onlooker and to make, immune us, to make us immune to being able to be honest about the real issues in our lives. Then we'll make a few inane resolutions such as eating less candy, exercising more at the gym that we paid that exorbitant membership for, being nice to animals and small children, and of course, attending church more, being nice and all that. But thus, we deceive ourselves and everybody while the real resolutions that could lead into some significant new beginnings in our life are left off our minds. And I know it's true because I preached to myself this morning so many times I've done the very same thing. I've tried it and it never works. And the counterpart to that doesn't work either. 
I've tried that to never ever mention the bad things again. To forget the errors again. And believe if we ignore the past, it never really happened. Right? Wrong. That doesn't work either. There are two essential steps to a successful new beginning. The first is remembering And the second is moving forward. It's not only important to remember our personal past through which we have lived. It is equally important to remember the past through which we did not live. But that influences our lives and the world in which we do live today. All that. And I do want you to understand. I know it's not January. It's July. It is hot And sweat-wrenching July. But it is a time of change. It is a time of loss and for some of grief. And of course, it is a time for new beginnings for all of us at Kingswood this morning. It's an appropriate time, therefore, for us to look back and to be advised and strengthened by the past so that we may be prepared for what the future holds for us. It's not a time to be lazy, nor is it a time to rest on our laurels and think everything is hunky-dory. By all means, to simply forget it doesn't work either. Our heritage is not only in private recollections. Our heritage is heavily endowed with shared memories that speak to us from the past. Voices from the past who address us all. There is a history that predates the lives of any yet living, without which we are ill-prepared to meet the future. Take a moment and remember the lives of your patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith. Again, in ministry matters, they say, the very fabric of our faith calls us to look back and to remember. Some of the most tragic stories in the Bible have to do with lives of people and nations who forgot. When the great prophets of Israel spoke, they nearly always began speaking by looking back. When we gather at the table of the Lord this morning, we're called to remember and to do this in remembrance of me. Our Jewish forebearers in the faith were constantly reminded by the Old Testament scriptures to remember the past. Deuteronomy told us this morning, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. The Jewish celebration of the Passover is an annual reminder and a reenactment of how God redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt. Passover is not only an acknowledgement of the power of God, it is a not-too-subtle warning that simply says, Stay out of Egypt, dude. Don't go back there. Remember what it was like? Who wants that anymore? Remembering is essential to freedom from past mistakes. The Spanish-born philosopher and critic George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So it becomes important to us, my friends. It becomes very important for us to never, ever empower the Back to Egypt Committee. There's a sense in which you and I are saved by history. Knowing history helps make up for the brevity of our lives. In our myopic view of reality, we sometimes forget that our brief sojourn on earth is but a drop of time in the ocean of eternity. Our personal part in history is infinitesimally small. So when we have this opportunity to begin again, we need to take stock of the past, face it head on, and turn together to God's preferred future for all of us. As I have stepped back and begun to look back And to remember what brought me to the place where I am this morning, I remember individuals specifically. I remember my grandmother, Edna Stace. I'm an adopted child. And in my family, my father and mother were six foot something. You get the picture? 
grandma was smaller than me by some miracle. And she was one who held my heart. She taught me how to fish. She was a Methodist, so she taught me how to play cards. <laughs> she even said it was okay to dance a jig every now and then. Just don't get too used to it. She taught me that the upper room was the best devotional tool that you could ever have by having me crawl in bed with her every morning as she read the day's upper room for me and prayed with me. A woman of great faith. A woman who had seen a lot of struggle in her life. On the flip side, there was my mother who did not like her mother-in-law who told us all these terrible things about grandma so that we would like my mother better than we would like my grandma. And for a little kid, it was quite confusing. But grandma only came a few times a year, all the way from Indiana. Can't we just be happy? It was not happiness when grandma came. I remember my pastor growing up, Dr. Ray Harrison, Ray was the pastor of the first Methodist church in Brandon, Florida, saw it become the first United Methodist church in Brandon, Florida in 1968. And in 1969, he came to my mother's restaurant after I came home from school. He was sitting there, asked me to climb up into his lap, and we talked theology, uh, nine-year-old theology. Jesus loves me, this I know. The Bible's told me so. For me, Jesus came and wants me to live forever with him and, and to serve him while I am here so that others will follow suit. He and I got that going, and he said that I was smart enough to skip confirmation, which was for the 11- and 12-year-olds, and join the church that Christmas. That was my parents' Christmas gift to me to let me be confirmed. A cheap year for Santa. Santa. But I do remember most definitely when I went before the Florida Conference Board of Ordained Ministry and Ray was to be there, he excused himself for my interview. And I was brokenhearted that my one person in my corner who understood me would not be there. I remember MacArthur Brantley, who was a pastor in this conference, a great pastor serving many churches, who interviewed me for my North Georgia Board of Ministry interviews. He presented me to the board, and we met in his office in Elberton. If you've never been to Elberton, you're never going to go there because it's on the way to nowhere, by the way. But it's a cute church, beautiful place, beautiful people. And he met me, and we talked theology as a seminary grad. A lot different than the nine-year-old. And at that moment, as we talked and prayed together, and I was shaking with fear because this man's opinion mattered all so much, I left and called him and said, was everything okay? Did you see any red flags? And he said, the only thing red I saw was your tie. And since you're talking with me, I wonder would you come be my associate at Elberton? which began a lifelong time of him pouring into me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Mac developed cancer at age 62, he felt it best to retire from the conference and to go and just live the remaining parts of his life alone with his wife, Vicki. We met in the hallway that day of his retirement speech at annual conference, with tears in his eyes, he kissed me on this cheek, I will not forget, and whispered into my ear, it's all on you now. Thanks. <laughs> if he'd seen what was coming, I would have left with him. I grieve the loss of these now all gone in my life. But I celebrate the experiences that we had together. I look back and find strength for the journey. I tearfully look at the loss and what might have been had they lived to this day. And if they were in this sanctuary, what would they be thinking of me at this point in my journey? And I celebrate 
that they in my past have made me who I am today for you. For me, I have to name them repeatedly. Not just once and done, but often. And see how it might give me the foundation for a future that God is leading me into. You see, beloved, it is okay to remember and to grieve, but not to stay there and wallow. Take what we've learned and experienced to begin to turn and face a new way. Making me, the man that I am today, the preacher I am today, not one experience was wasted, even though I would have been happy to not have some of those experiences. The same for you. That makes Kingswood Church what it is today. The people of God that you are today. Not one thing was wasted. But used to develop you into the creation that God knew you can be. We're at a turning point, my friends. You can stay the church that you've always felt comfortable to be. Or you can learn from your experiences and be the church that God is calling you to be in this time and in this season. A church for all people. A church with open hearts, open minds, and open doors. A church that sacrifices much for the sake of one person to be brought into the loving arms of Jesus Christ because of your service and your faithfulness and your discipleship. A church that strives to be a loving community where all are welcome, the lost are found, and disciples are made for the transformation of the world. Sound familiar? Transformation. Change. A new beginning. For the whole world. Yes, there's a time to grieve. And a time that you can look back and think and give praise and shed a tear. And I know that you have much to grieve with the great and wonderful pastorate of, after nine years of Charles and June. And even some of those who came before them. I know all of the predecessors of my pastorhood here, and each one has left a mark on you, whether you know it or not, as they each have on me. Joe Bowen was my first district superintendent. Dave Benson stood beside me at Sally and my wedding. Chuck Savage was one of the first people I began to understand and helped me break through that cross-culture appointments can happen. We need to hear these stories. We need to lance the wounds. We need to offer solace to each other. But there comes a time to hand our tears and our broken hearts to the one who can dry them and mend them and bring joy and wholeness to you and to me as we live by faith and look forward to his preferred future. Look forward all, using all we remember and all we have learned, and step out in faith anew. The Holy Spirit's going to tell us when it's time. If we stay attuned to that, the Spirit will nudge us ever so gently, sometimes across the pew. I believe the Spirit is nudging us now, for there is a new beginning before all of us. The big question, though, is how will we face it? One of my favorite movies is the movie called It's a Wonderful Life. And we're going to rediscover that movie during Advent. There's a scene where George Bailey says, I wish I'd never been born. To which Clarence, the angel who's trying to earn his wings so desperately, utterly replies, Oh, George, you should never say that. And all of a sudden he thinks, and the howling wind stops, and the stillness comes... The door opens and Clarence says, George, you've got your wish. You've never been born. And if you know the movie, you know what happens from there. If you don't know the movie, you better get used to it because we're going to be talking about it. My friends, in our grief, happy or sad, and in our remembering, we are being given a very special gift by God. A very special gift by God himself. A new beginning. A new start. How will it look for you? How will you and I look at it? How will we respond? 
What will we take forward with us and what shall we leave behind? This moment is the season of new beginnings. A special gift by God for you, for me, and for us together as Kingswood United Methodist Church. Let's remember. Let's begin again. I hear tell from Paul's letter in Corinthians that all things are possible through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.